Okay, welcome West Civ students to the 3083 Evelyn Street Lecture Hall. Uh, I'm your host once again, Mr. Stephen Hagen. We're going to go through uh, some basics on Unit 10, uh, the build-up to World War I. So everything we're going to talk about today, we're just setting the stage and what really what we're going to talk about uh, in class for the next uh, two weeks here is setting the stage for World War I, all the build-up that goes before it, and then we're going to end the year uh, talking about World War One, so we're going to jump right in. Everyone in class uh, has a specific assignment um, associated with uh, with my lecture today. Uh, so over the next thirty to forty minutes, as I'm talking here, uh, you're each going to have an assigned role based on your last name, similar to last week. Um, so be focused on that for your part. In class on Thursday, when we have our live session. Uh, same thing as last week, I'll be expecting you to be able to answer some questions based on what your role was uh, associated with today. So we'll jump right into that uh, in just a minute here. Uh, I'll start with kind of where I want you guys to be towards the end of the lecture here. Uh, I want you guys to be analyzing the greatest impact of the Industrial Revolution. So uh, we've gone through the Industrial Revolution, we've talked about it and debated it. Now I want you guys to, to analyze coming out of that as we look into the new systems that are created, uh, specifically in the first, I would say, 10 to 15 minutes of today's lecture, uh, what is the impact of that? Uh, and, and, and is it good or bad uh, is the ultimate question. Now, your essential question, and this is going to be what you're going to be doing your warm-up on in your Google Doc warm-up uh, sheet, is, is this question here. Would Jesus vote or support a policy that in the short term caused some hurt, death, or tribulation, but in the longer term caused great freedom and healing for millions. So please respond to that question in your warm-up doc under the date 42120. So title the, the date there and then answer the question. Um, so as you guys are doing that, um, you know, I just I think about this question all the time. Uh, it's the idea of the greater good. Uh, do you sacrifice something in the short term for a greater good in the long term? And, and would Jesus kind of be a part of that? And so, I don't know is the answer for me. Uh, but, and maybe that's your answer too. Is like, I don't know. This is not um, easy for me to answer. But then, you know, tell me why. Tell me, tell me why you think Jesus, uh, based on what side of the fence that you're on, tell me why you think Jesus would be on the side that you think. Um, there's, there's no real right or wrong answer, but uh, if, if you try to use the Bible as kind of your guideline, um, take a look at his life, kind of where was he on that spectrum in, in terms of the government. And this is kind of the theme that we've been talking about in our class. And if you want to use uh, our TFT, our teacher transformation tagline in our class to rise above the fray, you know, with Jesus dealing with the Pharisees all the time, trying to trap him, how does Jesus rise above the fray with this question? So maybe, maybe your answer isn't one side or the other, um, but it definitely can be. But maybe it's not one side or the other, but what is that next level that maybe Jesus would, would be talking about? Uh, so we'll circle back to this at the end. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to keep moving on with the lecture, unless you want to pause it right now to answer this question. You're welcome to do that. Otherwise, uh, we'll circle back to this at the end. So for our group work, as a reminder, since the screen's going to be hard to see here, uh, the PowerPoint is posted on Google Classroom. Please have that pulled up so that you can follow along as I'm, as I'm lecturing so that you can kind of see a little bit better. If you want to split screen it, put me on the one side and then the PowerPoint on the other. Um, that could work. So if your last name is uh, letters A through G, you need to be prepared uh, to do a timeline, or you should be doing a timeline of key events from chapters 22 uh, or 23, or maybe you want to do a couple events, like three events from chapter 22 and two events from chapter 23. But be prepared with about five events to contribute to class. So I might just call on you and be like, uh, you know, Brady Anderson, uh, tell me three events in your timeline from chapter 22 or 23 or between the two. And you'll have to tell me three key events that you can pull out from the text um, that are important. You also need to pick three vocabulary terms from each of the chapters and be prepared to tell us the who, what, when, and why that, uh, of why that term matters. So just give us some background on the term. Uh, when I call on you, 
Don't just tell me the definition from a textbook, all right? It's a little bit more than that in terms of the who, what, and when, and then the why this matters, okay? Uh, so probably, you know, just like a short 30 second blurb is kind of what I would anticipate you to say in class. Maybe, you know, just quick to the point about what your vocab word is, all right? Uh, the, the next group, letters H through P, I want you to look at the chart on page 704, page 704, and be prepared to fill in the details about each of the members and values associated with the terms listed, okay? So take a look at that for H through P. Last names Q through Z, Q through Z, you're looking at the chart on page 738, and be prepared to fill in the details about Italy and Germany associated with their key participants and events and the role and ideology they played in those two countries. So we're gonna talk about some political turmoil in France, Italy, and Germany, but focusing on Italy and Germany, look at the ideologies there and how it played out in those two, two countries in terms of what happens there. All right, we're gonna start with public health. So this is kind of where we're gauging that warm-up question. Uh, we have this big idea that emerges from this guy named Jeremy Bentham, uh, utilitarianism, and it's a mouthful to say. <laughs> But the idea is, uh, his idea is public policy that is put in place um, in terms of the legislature, like voting on things, uh, the public policy that's put in place should always be based on answering this question, which is, does this promote the, go the most good for the greatest amount of people? And now this is where it goes back to my warm-up question. What if this legislation that promotes the greatest good for the greatest amount of people comes at a cost for a small group of people. Do you still vote for it? Uh, you know, uh, but his idea is we need to create policy that makes the, the greatest amount of good for as many people as possible. Sounds like a great plan. Does it always work out that way in real life? It's an interesting question for you to answer. All right, big improvements in city planning comes along. Before this, uh, there wasn't much city planning at all. Uh, I'm just thinking of uh, here in Roseville, I just got a letter last week uh, about a public park that's going in that was voted on two years ago, uh, and they're, they're now putting in uh, an addition to the park to make it a little bit bigger, and there's trails that are cutting through here and there, and there's all these plans that go into it. And it's very robust. There's, there was tons of hearings about it uh, in, our, in our city, about this you know, big thing that we're doing, uh, and there's just all this planning that goes into it. We we're talking in an age where there was like zero planning involved. Uh, streets are just made by common paths that common paths turn into streets uh, and people are just putting up buildings every which way and so at this time with the overcrowdingness that's going on in these urban areas because people are flocking into the cities to work in these factory jobs people start to think maybe we should have a rhyme and a reason for how we build our city uh, and so city improvements start to, to shift in terms of the idea of having parks it becomes like this this kind of a thing like hey, maybe we should set aside land in the city where you can go and there's not a factory and there's not a giant building that's super hot and uh, full of smoke. It'd be really nice to have some fresh air and for people to be able to go there and just to like walk around with trees and grass because you'd have to like go way out into the countryside to be able to get to that, whereas that's just, that's gonna take too long, uh, like, you know, an all day trek or multiple day trek to do that. Wouldn't it be nice just to have that like in the city? So. The whole idea of like public parks uh, comes into play here. Another big breakthrough is in uh, germ theory. Just the idea of how people get sick is something we take for granted that we know today, but people back then were really struggling with. And now we have the first kind of breakthrough scientifically on why people are getting sick. Uh, and a lot of it comes from germs, which are microscopic living organisms that are on your skin that we know today, right? Uh, and so all the, the diseases, and the viruses are chunked into that category and is what's causing people to get sick with their, their, their typhoid fever uh, and malaria and, and, and what have you. So germ theory comes into practice and people start uh, really taking that into account for how to solve some of the, the crises that they're facing with, with, with typhoid and with polio and um, malaria, things like that. We have the rise of public transportation. People uh, are less and less relying on, on horses to get around the city. It's too cumbersome to have a horse in a stable and everything like that. It's expensive uh, and it's just really causing a lot of pollution in the cities. And so people start to 
uh, transport uh, via trolleys, these electronic trolleys that move people uh, up and down city streets. And it's the first form of public transportation funded by governments. Uh, and it's originally, they're actually first, your textbook talks about our uh, private companies, uh, but then the government kind of expands for the, for the needs of the people um, to, for, for public transportation. So the roots of that comes from, from this era. You can see here in this picture uh, on your PowerPoint, if you look at the different levels of this house, you can see, you know, kind of from the, the top down, it's kind of actually upside down, uh, but the layers of how people are living, like, like the luxury and peace that these people are living in the middle uh, with these ornate backgrounds, and they're kind of living on top of you know, this, this giant room with, with really high walls, you know, and they're living on top of their servants down here who are crowded into these tight places, uh, and it's very busy. Uh, and as well, you have this impoverished class up here, like they're living in an attic, right, where the dust and rats are, and it's just super packed. Uh, and as well, you have these people here who are kind of, they're out of the attic, they're not super poor, but they're, they're striving to get into this more middle, strong, growing class here that has a little bit more room, it's a little higher ceiling, it's a little bit less crowded, it's not as small as these tiny little quarters are here, uh, but they're definitely not living in this absolute luxury. Uh, they're having a decent, good living here, uh, and they're really trying to make their way down to this level here where they have everything you could ever want. But this is like, again, just, just like the French Revolution, again, that's like the very tiny uh, part of society here is in this less than 5%, okay? Uh, and then for a retrospect, your textbook talks about uh, that they're controlling 40, almost 40% of the wealth, between 30 and 40% of the wealth, this 5% here. So this, not a lot changes based on the percentages of the control of wealth from the Industrial Revolution, but what does change is the standard of living, okay? People start to figure out what's causing sicknesses. Uh, transportation is improving, okay? Uh, the city planning is improving. Your lungs are getting healthier as an individual in society. So overall, uh, you have a little bit more money in your pocket, you have a little bit more freedom politically, uh, and you have a healthier lifestyle starting to emerge. And so overall, overall the picture for the middle class and for the poor is improving. All right? The wealth gap is closing a little bit, but for the most part, that hasn't changed drastically. All right? You're not seeing like topsy turviness You're not seeing people just moving straight through you know, multiple classes in a quick succession. Um, it's not like we have in today's society where if you come up with a great idea and you can get investment, you can become the next Mark Zuckerberg, okay? Um, not the case. Okay. Uh, the next big uh, movement is with the feminist movement, uh, women gaining the right to vote specifically. There's a large push for middle class women who are banding together and they want better education. Number one, they believe that if they have better education, that'll provide for them better professional employment opportunities. So it wasn't like women didn't have jobs. It was like the jobs that they had were getting paid less than men. However, women were not getting professional jobs that could provide for a family. The most that women were getting uh, were small end jobs, uh, whether full time or part time, that didn't pay very well and could not support a family by any means. So women wanted the ability to especially single women, either are divorced or uh, other women who uh, didn't want to rely on their husbands for work, or maybe women who couldn't bear children, uh, they, they wanted to be professionals and be as, as equal to men. And so they wanted to become professional teachers, doctors, uh, and, um, and, and kind of rise up the ranks through professional jobs. Um, and so they were, they were pushing for those kind of abilities. And in some cases, they, they won victories, but for the most part, they did not. Um, the big push was full property rights. Uh, and then uh, the, the suffrage movement in 1919 in England with the right to vote. Okay? Uh, and, and the United States follows this shortly after. But um, I guess what I want to say is we're going to see more of this um, later on. So we're not through with feminism. Uh, but the roots here are very strong in terms of getting the right to vote, the suffrage of 1919. Because beyond that, you're, you're just not going to be able to get very far if you don't have the right to vote. 
So open, can you imagine half of your population in your country can't vote. And then all of a sudden, everyone can. That's a big move. Okay? The socialists of Europe are largely in favor of, of women's rights. And so women are increasingly moving to that side of the political spectrum, which probably didn't help them in terms of getting the right to vote because people were very concerned, the conservatives were very concerned that they would just overwhelm the voting system in the majority of a socialist structure that women would then support, uh, which tended not to be the full case. Okay, moving on to uh, Darwin, art, and the second industrial revolution. For context, we are currently like entering into what's known as like the fourth industrial revolution. Like the third industrial revolution is more of the, uh, you know, the, the movement kind of like 1950s, but primarily 1990s with the rise of the internet and the dot, dot com era. And the internet is kind of like the third industrial revolution, but uh, you know, even kind of going back before that with uh, like the production of World War One or World War Two uh, and the economy of the 1950s really increasing nationwide in this country, but all over the world. And then kind of now we're entering into that fourth uh, industrial revolution with this this rise of globalism and trade that we're seeing now today, uh, and not not just the internet uh, era. Uh, but small businesses as well, just absolutely taking off. So it's also the, the, our fourth, I know this isn't quite from the textbook, um, a bit of a tangent, but the, the industrial revolution that we're going through now also has to do a lot with clean energy. And it's very exciting there to see what the future holds for that. So, okay. Uh, I love this, this uh, picture. This is Charles Darwin here. He says, if you don't want to quarantine, it's okay. And if you think about it, this is Charles Darwin basically saying, uh, if you don't want to quarantine, uh, you know, the uh, you ever see someone do something uh, really, really silly and foolish, uh, and you, you know it's like, oh, another person taking themselves out of the gene pool. It's a very uh, sad thing to say, uh, and that uh, those ideas or those jokes kind of stem from Charles Darwin and his idea of social Darwinism. And the idea of social Darwinism is the idea of the survival of the fittest. And if you if you go out and do really foolish things time and time again. Eventually, uh, the piper gets paid and it doesn't go well for you. Uh, and so this idea of survival of the fittest, not just in the animal kingdom, which has kind of been like this scientific thing that's been emerging from Darwinism, uh, leads into the ideas of social patterns. And people start to think along the lines of, if you are poor, it's because you are not the fittest to survive. Or because you are wealthy and very successful, then you therefore are socially fit for society. And so everyone should be scrapping uh, to, to try to get to the top to be the most, uh, to, to be the fittest, to survive. Uh, and it's just a way for, really, it just kind of became a way for like wealthier middle class people to explain away the problems of the poor in society. Uh, and I don't know what you think about that, um, but it's definitely something that we don't necessarily strongly see it today, but we definitely see aspects of... Um, you know, the idea of where people are at in society for what reasons. Um, and we, I think we all know that Christ came for us all, and he came to love us all, and he came no matter what class that we are in, right? Uh, we're not going to go super in-depth about evolution and, his, and Darwin's ideas about all of that. You're going to get plenty of that in your science curriculum. Um, but his ideas on uh, Darwin's ideas of survival of the fittest, I wanted to mention, your textbook mentions, starts to apply um, to kind of the world in terms of where people are at financially on their success. The second industrial revolution a lot focuses a lot on electricity and a lot of research and development, R&D, research and development, uh, and making more advances in the fields that were already sustained. So lots of new economic growth based on new ideas, uh, and this is kind of where the second industrial revolution finds its sweet spot. In art, you have the ideas of realism. Artists start to look at the negative effects of the Industrial Revolution, uh, whether it be like sweatshops or poor working conditions or children working or people who are just scrapping day in and day out just try to get out of that poor class but they can't ever get into the middle class. Artists start to see these events and they start to like, I want to show real painting and then uh, this is the era when we're moving into photographs. Uh, 
the real life people and, and where they're at. We're not just gonna paint these big ornate pictures of beauty and landscapes and, and wealth and power and, and historical presence. We wanna show everyday people. I mean, it's smart, one, because everyday people, you know, that's, their, that's a big market, uh, but also it just hits right here when you see hardship. Um, in the Great Depression in the United States, we sent around photographers to, to literally, uh, because artists were just unemployed like crazy. And so we hired artists in our country during the Great Depression to artistically capture the Great Depression. And it leads to some very stunning images of what people went through uh, and just like tugged at those heartstrings, which becomes very popular, okay? Uh, so that idea is realism, depicting the exact life uh, of, of individuals. Okay, all right, we're gonna pivot and we're gonna talk about three different countries that go through some upheaval. Uh, in Europe, France, Italy, and Germany. And then we're gonna look at kind of what their background was in terms of their ideology and what worked and didn't work in those countries. Uh, and then at the end, we'll circle back to that big question of the effects of the Industrial Revolution, was it successful? And we're gonna look at the political policies. Um, and then we're gonna look at, um, you know, is your, was a person's life better in the middle class because of the Industrial Revolution? So France goes through what's called the Second Republic, and they elect the president, Napoleon III, which is the nephew of Napoleon, uh, and he uh, gains power uh, through a vote. He gets voted in as president of France on their, on their new constitution, and he's extremely popular. People love him because he's going to bring stability to France with his previous uh, you know, uncle's heritage name. Uh, he's not going to let the socialists just run rampant. Uh, he is going to keep in line with kind of this idea of, of a monarchy, but you know, a president here, uh, in his case, or control of the country, a conservative mindset, but he's going to usher in reforms, such as talking about universal male suffrage, giving all men in France the right to vote, uh, which is something his, his uncle Napoleon had, had pitched and had success with. And so when that, that rescinded as well. So he's looking at bringing that back. He's getting pretty widespread support in the urban areas of France and in the outskirts of France and the countryside, and he gets elected president. Uh, but he doesn't like how things are going, and he overthrows the legislature. Uh, and the reason why he does that is because they weren't doing enough for the people of France. That was his claim. And so immediately after he overthrows this legislature in a literal coup d'etat, a coup, like an overthrow of the government uh, on a small level, uh, he instigates massive public work projects like we do during the Great Depression. And so the government of France starts hiring people left and right to do massive public work projects throughout France, building railroads every which way, public roads, bridges, you name it. Uh, he is building it and you are getting paid uh, and employed and not just like paid like a, a barely above it, like he paid people really well. And so <laughs> that made him very, very popular. Uh, and he gets elected. He basically issues out a, a referendum saying, should I be uh, the, the leader, the president for the next 10 years instead of a four year term or was it a six year term? And he overwhelmingly gets granted this in this referendum, uh, more power for a decade. All, all the while he had basically abolished the legislature. It's a huge power grab, huge power grab, right? Uh, but his popularity starts to decrease as does all leaders. Uh, and socialist movements gain power, all right? And he's kind of like, oh no, the socialists want to gain power. Instead of putting them down or having some kind of like, you know, movement, he works with the legislature that he kind of reinstates or so-and-so or allows to kind of start to come back to power and starts giving the legislature what they want, which is more and more socialists in the legislature and allowing them uh, to kind of run things on their own as well. Uh, as long as they're not really removing him from power. So it's kind of like this peace deal. Uh, and he's smart because he, he knew what happened to his uncle and the other leaders of France in the 48 revolutions. And so he's kind of thinking, let's be smart about this. Uh, and so it's interesting play in France. He kind of saw what happened in Great Britain uh, and what happened there um, with, with the political leaders who wanted to stay in power uh, and repealing the corn laws and kind of keeping the peace in England and issuing a 10 hour limit for a work day, like giving the people rights and freedoms that the socialists so desperately wanted, but at the same time kind of keeping in place 
uh, the power structure of top down, right? In Italy, you have a country that is completely broken up and subjugated into all these different city-states um, that basically since the fall of the Roman Empire hasn't been united. Uh, and so you have, um, you know, different um, governments in control of different areas all throughout France. And so how is France going to come together? So when we're talking about nationalism becoming very popular during this time, and it's only going to become more popular as we go on, Italy has some strong nationalistic leaders who want to unify Italy. Like France has been unified, like Austria has been unified, like England's been unified, and Italy kind of wants to join those ranks. Um, and so how do they do that? Well, you can't either by war uh, or negotiations, right? And so a couple of figures stand out. Count, count means very wealthy uh, in, in Italy and France specifically, uh, like the, the book Count of Monte Cristo, that's someone who's extremely wealthy, has a large estate, lots of land, power, etc. So this count, so you, you know that his background is wealthy, uh, Camillo Cavour, he unifies northern Italy under a government, uh, and he, he does so as a statesman. He's not a president or like a, he's just a political figure uh, from Sardinia, uh, and what his purpose is to unify Italy, uh, kind of um, unify Italy, uh, I would say, from a logistical standpoint, kind of a chunk at a time. He's not some revolutionary who wants to overthrow the whole system and just, you know, punch through like this new wave of, of nationalism. He's like, how do we realistically do this um, so that it works in the long term? Well, and he's really smart. So he gets together with France, because Austria at this time has part of northern Italy kind of within their grasp. And so he wants to take uh, that back in, uh, for Italy uh, out of France's possession, and so, or out of Austria's possession. So he goes to France, because France and Austria don't get along very well at this time. He says, hey, France, let's provoke a war with Austria, and when we win, we get most of this land back. Uh, and at the time, France was kind of itching to join in on that, to get back at Austria for some things, and so they join. And uh, at the last second, France kind of betrays them, uh, and they work out a deal essentially where the majority of the land that belonged to Italy will go to Italy But a small portion will go to France and Italy's like well We'd rather have more land come to us and lose a little bit to France than not having anything and having Austria have most of it back so that gains a lot of public support uh, for Count Camillo Cavour uh, and his ideas for a unified Italy uh, and they gain a lot of territory back then there's this other guy, uh, Giuseppe Garibaldi. Uh, he's like the more radical, like punch through, like get it done, nationalistic figure. Like we're going to unify Italy at all costs. Everyone's going to get the right to vote. Everyone's going to be free. Uh, we're going to have a new government and we're all going to be united. Like, you know, bringing back those themes of like the Roman Empire. Like we're going to have this great country again. Uh, you know, <laughs> make Italy great again. That's probably, you know, his, his, his mindset is... Um, like Italy first and Italy last, right? And very radical in the southern part of Italy. And he starts to take over kind of bit by bit in the south. And he starts to make a move towards um, towards Naples, and then which is kind of in the southern part. And then the next step is Rome, and and like the Pope the Pope areas, which at this time kind of haven't really joined either Giuseppe's side or Camillo's side. And Carvor sends troops into Rome. Uh, and there's gonna, like there's a standoff, like what's going to happen? Are these two sides going to like fight, north versus south? And the money's in the north, and the population's in the north. The south of, of Italy is like this rural, agrarian, like farmer society. Um, they, they really want their independence and their freedom, uh, but it's a much slower style of life. A lot like the United States, like between in the Civil War, in the north, Production, population, railroads, everything's just busy, 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 going, 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 just like it is in our society. You go down south, even to this day, things are a lot slower. Uh, and uh, it's just things take a little bit more time uh, and people are a little bit more laid back. And that's the stereotype, but it's often very true. And so that's, that's kind of the dynamics of northern and southern Italy at this time. And uh, they actually decide to unify. Uh, Camillo Cavour and Giribaldi get together and in Rome and they sign peace agreements and it unites Italy. Uh, they, uh, I don't have it here, but they unite under the guise 
of uh, a new constitution that the people of Italy can get behind, uh, and they, they unite their, their two forms of, of government styles uh, and grant large scale, not total male suffrage, but for the most part, and uh, you have a unified Italy for the first time in a long time. And so the, the, the nationalism in Italy is extremely high um, because they, they have like this big standoff, like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? And it, peace kind of works out. So kind of a cool thing there that, that happens. So if you're looking at middle class people, everyday people in Italy uh, and everyday people in France, so far the effects of the Industrial Revolution, uh, the, the political fallout has been pretty positive. It's, there's been some clashes, but it hasn't led to large-scale violence or rebellions. We're not seeing blood just dripping in the streets, uh, and people are kind of working things out. So overall, it's like, oh, this, is, this is going well. But all of the suffering and the toil and the hardship that they had to go through in terms of their factory life and their everyday life, if you go back to that painting with the apartment, uh, those are very real. So it's like, think about that question. Like, is it worth it? Also, you have to think about the realistic idea of how else could this have played out? Like, okay. Last example, we're wrapping up here. In Germany, uh, you have a prime minister. His name is Otto von Bismarck. He's a very famous character. We're going to uh, stick with him for quite some time. Uh, he is in favor of unifying Germany and wants to do so through kind of like force. Uh, he wants to lay down the law. He's on the military side of things. Uh, and wants to leave his impression to unify Prussia and create a German country. Uh, just to rival France, he doesn't like France at all, uh, and uh, to become like a European power, like dominant European power, more powerful than Russia and England and France uh, and, and, and little Italy and, and, and Austria as well, for sure Austria. So um, Otto Ben Bismarck extends Prussian lands with the blessing of King William I. So they have like this parliamentary system in Germany where William uh, has control and is that uh, the, the the political king. Uh, and King William is like, you know what? This Otto Ben Bismarck is a good prime minister. He wants what's best for Germany, but the legislature is kind of preventing us from making these changes in society that we want to 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 make Germany more powerful. And so. King William and Otto von Bismarck kind of conspire and say, are like, hey, you know what? We're going to kind of get away with the legislature. Um, a lot like uh, Napoleon III did in France. And it goes really well, a lot like Napoleon in France III, who orchestrates these giant public work projects. What he was doing was distracting the people from his power grab. You can't just take power uh, and, um, you know, unless you have a very strong cause to do it and, and the people are in line to do that. And that's generally when either chaos is happening and people want you to come in to, to settle that chaos uh, or you're distracting them with something else. Um, you know, bread and circuses, going back to the Roman era when the emperors were having you know, large spread problems uh, throughout the Roman Empire, if you just distract everyone with food and parties and gladiator games, no one thinks that anything bad is happening. Interesting correlation. Okay, so uh, the what happens is uh, they start a war with France. Like, you know what? France is this old enemy. Uh, let's prove that we're better than them. And they, they fight a war in France. They double the size of the German army within a year uh, and train them up very well. Uh, and uh, they kick France's butt. And they, they, they issue some extreme terms against France uh, for this peace deal. And the German people are like, oh my gosh, we just beat, like, not just beat, like we whooped up on France. This causes huge German nationalism. And people fall in line with King William I and Otto von Bismarck like that. And they're like, German legislature, they're too slow. They're not getting anything done. You know, uh, it's just, the, 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 you know, that swamp, right, of the German legislature. Oh, they're not getting anything done. Uh, but look at this. These guys come into power and like that, we just kicked France's butt. Uh, and so people are super in favor of these guys in power. Uh, and they have like this semi-authoritarian, nationalistic uh, blend. Uh, and they issue male suffrage. And again, the socialists in Germany do start to really come through and make a lot of noise. Like, hey, you can't be having all of this authoritarian rule uh, with, you know, without consent of the people. Like, you have it now, but what happens in the future? And, and, and what are your legal 
lines of what you can and can't do uh, for these two gentlemen here. Uh, and so that's causing, and it causes a big stir. Um, uh, but, but for the most part, uh, they, they don't see too much conflict with that. And we're going to see what happens in Germany's case going forward when someone has uh, as much power as they do and popularity. So uh, let's go back to the beginning here in case you have forgotten. All right. Make sure you guys do your warm-up. Here's the essential question. Would you just vote or support a policy that is in short, uh, the short term causes some kind of hurt or death or tribulation, but in the long term makes things very good, good freedom and healing at the end for millions? Uh, would you just get behind that? Please answer that in your warm-up doc. Uh, and then uh, don't forget about your assigned group work for the lecture uh, in live class, or not the, for the lecture, for the live class on Thursday. So... Um, please email me if you have any questions, thoughts, or concerns. I'm here to help. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed the lecture hall event today at 3083 Evelyn Street. <laughs> uh, and uh, I look forward to hopefully seeing you guys in person soon. Um, so, yeah. Ta see you guys in class on Thursday.